Part 2, Chapter 4 of The Origins of Christianity by Thomas Whitaker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Von Manen on the Pauline Literature. Part 2, The Epistle to the Romans. Chapter 4, Whence Came the Epistle? A. Significance of the Preceding Investigation if not in the abstract impossible it is at least highly improbable that paul himself should have put together under the external form of a letter a composition of the kind described the result of the analysis in any case contradicts the accepted tradition as to the origin of the epistle to the romans since this is taken to be an actual letter bringing us face to face with the original thought of the apostle to meet the arguments however that will still be urged against rejecting the apostolic authorship a new investigation is requisite the question must be put as if it had not already received its answer was the epistle written by paul and in connection with this investigation we must try to determine positively whence the writing proceeded b improbability of the tradition as has been said already we in vain seek to learn why paul wrote a letter of the kind to the roman christians or what was his relation to them how is it that he is able to take such a tone of authority towards men with whom he has never personally come in contact tradition of course replies that paul was an apostle of jesus christ and as such possessed and claimed authority and indeed the writer of the epistle speaking in paul's name comes forward in this spirit chapter one verse one his right to instruct and praise and warn is taken for granted all through the fact that paul is an israelite even contributes to the proof that god has not rejected his people chapter eleven verse one from the supernaturalist point of view there is of course no difficulty about this but those for whom that point of view has become obsolete cannot so easily admit that the apostles themselves could without arrogance assume straightway the attributes a grateful posterity was to invest them with paul as an intelligent man could not take this high tone with christians unknown to him whom he desired to win for his cause and the more if the traditional story is true that there were already divisions in the church it is remarkable that he gives no plain and succinct statement of his principles but supposes an acquaintance on the part of his audience with the outlines of paulinism there are in the epistle one may put it in parliamentary language some things hard to be understood second peter chapter three verse sixteen to speak more bluntly the uncertainty in which we are often left as to the writer's meaning is due to the presence of contradictory utterances this is how things appear when we no longer see the head of the venerable apostle surrounded with the nimbus that for ages adorned it when he has become for us simply a human figure from whom we expect only the possible and the probable that a zealous preacher of the gospel who hoped ere long to pay a visit to the christians at rome should write to them beforehand a lengthy and obscure epistle in a tone of apostolic authority is possible but it is not probable moreover we should not expect that kind of literary activity from an artisan preacher like the paul of new testament tradition acts chapter eighteen verses three through four chapter ten verses thirty three through thirty four first corinthians chapter four verse twelve second thessalonians chapter three verse eight compare with second corinthians chapter eleven verses eight through nine chapter twelve verse thirteen all evidence as to the effect of the epistle on the roman christians 
is wanting. According to the ordinary view, it was sent about A.D. 59. After that, there is no trace of it, until, more than half a century later, we find it held in honor by the Gnostics. Where was it preserved before it came? We know not how. Into the hands of men like Basilides and Marcion. C. Indications of a later time. Much in the epistle to the Romans, apart from these antecedent improbabilities, points to a later date than 59, or than 64, in which year, according to the tradition, Paul suffered martyrdom. To this order of facts belong, in the first place, doctrinal utterances. The Jewish law has been definitely broken with. The light which the Gentiles had by nature chapter 1 verses 19 through 21 could bring them as far in the knowledge of god as their revelation could bring the jews the law was as inadequate as natural light to the universal need to rescue men in general from bondage to sin a new revelation was required if indeed some among the chosen people have been found doers of the law this is no more than has been achieved among the gentiles who having not the law are a law unto themselves chapter 2 verses 13 and 14 far from saving men the law rather called slumbering evil into life by reawakening the desire opposed to its commands for the christian it has lost its significance he is liberated from sin in being liberated from the law chapter six verse fourteen the new revelation is without the law chapter three verse twenty one god has found the means for the salvation of sinners which the old law could not effect he has sent his son by faith in whom men are to be saved that is made capable of living a life pleasing to god there is no question of merit all is grace the new dispensation of spirit opposed to the letter of the old testament is a dispensation of the grace of god to paul a special grace has been granted so that he can speak of my gospel which is no other than the gospel of god or simply the gospel he and the believers in his gospel are under the guidance of the holy ghost they walk after the spirit chapter eight verse four this new gospel of belief in the son of god is the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began chapter sixteen verse twenty five for the writer of the epistle in its general form the god who is the author of this revelation is identical with the god of the jews but there are indications that originally it was not so when there is mention of the law of god simply chapter eight verse seven it is not the mosaic law that is meant but the law of faith as distinguished from the law of works chapter three verse twenty seven the jew is under illusion when he thinks he has the form of knowledge and of the truth chapter two verse twenty the true god is not as we might suppose the governor of the world rather he stands in opposition to this world chapter twelve verse two as the spirit to the flesh the created world of sense or of unreason was subjected to vanity by him who subjected it chapter 8 verse 20 that is not by god nor yet by the devil but by a power resembling the demiurge of the gnostics this power basilides called the great archon his empire extended to the visible heaven he was under the delusion that he was the highest god but was afterwards made aware of his error by the sun and repented the rulers of this world 
who knew not what they did when they crucified the Lord of glory, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 8, were no earthly authorities, Jewish or Roman, but supernatural powers, the God's many and Lord's many, the demons, see for instance Romans chapter 8 verse 38, for the love of man, in order to rescue him from the powers of the world, God sent his son to die under their dominion, and then delivered him again from death, one of these lower hostile powers. The highest God is thus no longer the unknown. He has revealed himself. Believers in the new revelation know him for their father, as in a more special sense he is the father of his own son. They serve him in the spirit, no longer, like Jews and heathens, in temples made with hands. Jesus, from the Messiah or Christ of the early disciples, has become Christ the Son of God, the pre-existent supernatural being, sent in the likeness of flesh, though not flesh. To declare at once man according to the flesh, and the Son of God according to the Spirit, was a later development, springing from the effort to reconcile the newer with the older conception. In the epistle to the Romans, almost nothing is said of his life on earth. To the cross there is only one allusion. Chapter 6, verse 6. From this recapitulation of Paulinism, it must be evident that a considerable lapse of time was needed before such a system could be arrived at from a starting point so Jewish as that of the disciples of Jesus. And, if the data of the epistles are regarded as historical, there is no escape from the conclusion that Paul's distinctive gospel, the revelation of the Son in him, coincides in its origin with his conversion. Galatians chapter 1 verses 11 through 24. No period during which he was a Judeo-Christian can be interposed. And the received chronology cannot be materially altered consistently with acceptance of the epistles as genuine. Thus, we have to suppose his gospel in the main already present to his thought no more than three years after Jesus, that is, in 35 or 36, and extant in the form in which we know it, between 52 and 58 or 59. The zealot for Orthodox Judaism has no sooner been brought to see in Jesus of Nazareth the promised Messiah, than he goes on to regard him as the Son of God, sent down to earth for the sake of men preaches deliverance from the law, and appeals for his new conviction to a revelation of the Spirit. If we were not familiar with this representation from our youth, we should reject it at once as incredible. The difficulty of so rapid an advance for one who has been a Jew is realized when we think of the sharp opposition which Pauline Christianity still met with in the second and third centuries. That Paul himself came forward with the Pauline gospel at so early a date as that assigned is, if we consider it well, a psychological impossibility. It is simply unthinkable that Paul, the Jew, who had persecuted the Christian community out of religious conviction, should almost immediately introduce this colossal reform of a belief which he had only just begun to share. Had it not been for the influence of non-Jewish Eastern Gnosis, assimilating Greek philosophical conceptions and heathen mythology, the monotheism of Israel would have permanently withheld Christianity from the deification of its founder. Enoch, and Moses and Elijah were already imagined to have attained, in an exceptional way, to heaven 
without the thought arising that they had been other than human beings. If it is said that Paul of Tarsus might easily come in contact with Greek philosophy and Eastern Gnosis, the reply is at hand in an observation that has been made on the religion of Muhammad. There was no deification of its founder by Islam, because it was born too much in the light of history for unencumbered growth of legends. This applies completely to Paul, because for him Jesus was still in the full light of history. It may be said that, psychologically possible or not, there is the fact that Paul did come forward with his gospel. To this, the reply is that the supposed fact rests only on the epistles, of which we are investigating the genuineness. Turn to the passage in Galatians already referred to. It is in vain that we try to learn from it anything as to the mode of revelation of the new gospel. Nobody knows, as a French critic has rightly remarked, and it is idle to plunge into hypothesis in order to explain an assumed fact for which there is no historical warrant. Acquaintance with Paulinism By the time when the epistle to the Romans was written, there already existed a whole vocabulary of technical terms belonging to Paulinism. With these, the reader is assumed to be familiar. Faith and grace, righteousness and love, justification by faith, and by the works of the law, and so forth, are used without any feeling of difficulty in altogether peculiar senses. There are all sorts of standing questions connected with the Pauline gospel. Is there, where Jews and Greeks are concerned, respect of persons with God? Chapter 2, verse 11. Has the Jew, as such, any advantage over the Greek, seeing that both sin? In what sense may Abraham be called the father of Christians? If the Christian no longer lives under law, but under grace, is there not a danger that he may think sin permitted to him? How to explain the rejection of Israel? The readers of the epistle know and have accepted Paulinism as a peculiar form of doctrine. Chapter 6, verse 17. Now all this tells against its supposed early origin. If, on the other hand, the existence of a Pauline community or group at Rome about the year 59 is treated as a fiction of the writer who lived in a later generation, there is no difficulty in the case. Affinity with Gnosis That there is some close relationship between Paulinism and Gnosticism is generally admitted, however it may be explained whether by a pre-Pauline gnosis influencing Paul, or by the existence in his writings of germs which the Gnostics afterwards developed. Most of the Christian Gnostics are known to have held Paul in high honor. Tertullian undertakes to refute the heretics by the testimony of their own apostle, against Marcion, Book 1, Chapter 15. And, in fact, the Pauline writings are full of the phraseology and the ideas characteristic of Gnosticism. The same peculiar stress is laid on knowledge. We hear of the wisdom that is spoken among the perfect. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6-16 through 16. The highest knowledge rests neither on tradition nor on scripture but on a special revelation. It has pleased God, says Paul, to reveal his Son in me. Galatians chapter 1 verse 16. Compare with 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 10. For him and his there is a continual manifestation of the truth. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 2. They have nothing to do with the letter. Romans chapter 2 verse 29, chapter 7 verse 6, 
2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6. Like the Gnostics, they are spiritual, in possession of the spirit. Anti-Judaism, in spite of sentences to the contrary, scattered through the epistles, is just as much a characteristic of the Pauline as of the Gnostic teaching. The called stand opposed to both Jews and Greeks outside, as the saved to the lost. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 and 24. By the natural or animal man, who receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, is meant the Jew as well as the Greek. Like all Gnosis, Paulinism cares little for historical events, except as material for allegory. This indifference extends not only to the Old Testament, but to the actual life of Jesus on earth. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16. If dualism is a mark of the Gnostic teaching, it is no less a mark of the Pauline. We find opposed God and the world, which has its own rulers and elements. The wisdom of God and the wisdom of the world, God and Satan, God and his Son on the one side, and a series of powers hostile to them on the other, the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, and the blindness proceeding from the God of this world. Second Corinthians chapter 4 verse 4. The animal and the spiritual flesh and spirit, and so forth. The differences between Paulinism and Gnosticism are not greater than the mutual differences of the Gnostic systems known to us. We recognize both by the peculiar significance they give to certain words and phrases. Romans chapter 11 verse 33 and Antitheses chapter 8 verses 38 through 39. Thus, it may be stated as unquestionable that there are Gnostic elements in the Pauline writings, including the Epistle to the Romans. Now, whether Paulinism is to be placed at the origin of the Christian Gnosis, or later in its development, may be left for the present undetermined. In any case, these elements are fatal to the claim of the Epistles containing them to have been written by Paul. For the origin of Christian Gnosticism, if perhaps somewhat earlier that the last years of the reign of Trajan, who died 117, to which it is commonly assigned, cannot be carried back to a period within the lifetime of the Apostle. The Community There is nothing to prevent us from supposing a Christian community already in existence at Rome, when Claudius, A.D. 51-54, through 54, according to a statement of Suetonius, expelled the Jews from Rome. Claudius, chapter 25. If we refer the cause of this expulsion of the Jews to a strife that had arisen among them through the belief of some that Jesus was the Messiah, we may reasonably assume that in 59 the Christian or Messianic community was as much as 20 years old. The Epistle to the Romans, however, implies a considerable greater antiquity, for it presupposes more than the growth of a Messianic sect, a sect of the Nazarenes, similar to the sects of the Sadducees and Pharisees, and like them, included within the limits of Judaism. The community addressed numbers among its members, Paulinists, and even Paulinists with an eye for shades of difference within the general doctrine. This is not thinkable at so early a date, even if for a moment we suppose the doctrine to have developed in the mind of Paul himself to the stage it has attained in the Epistle to the Romans. The practical precepts, no less than the doctrinal developments, indicate the existence of a past that is not of yesterday. 
consider for example those that relate to the performance of a variety of functions by the many members of one body chapter twelve verses four through eight some members are weak in the faith compare chapter fourteen they avoid flesh and wine or pay scrupulous attention to distinctions of days and of clean and unclean meats others think it permissible to eat and drink of anything and treat all days alike so long have these differences subsisted that the writer mixes up with the judaizers those who have scruples about partaking of flesh and wine and has no better solution to offer than the genuinely catholic one of praising freedom and advising that it should not be put in practice persecutions such allusions to persecution to be undergone as we meet with in chapter twelve verses twelve and fourteen and other places point to a later date than fifty nine before that of nero there is no trace of such a persecution at rome and what is said to have occurred on the pretext of the great fire in sixty four had not the character of a general persecution of christians besides paul could not have thought of putting his readers in mind of that five years before it happened the rejection of israel the question so earnestly debated in romans chapter nine through eleven why israel the chosen people of god remains outside christianity could not arise till it had become evident that such with few exceptions was to be the permanent condition of things for this it was necessary that the gospel should have been preached in wide circles as is indeed everywhere presupposed and almost stated in so many words chapter ten verses thirteen through eighteen the opportunity has been offered to all but most have refused to accept it chapter eleven verse seven now in fifty nine nothing had yet happened to justify the assumption that israel must be regarded as broken off from the root a rejected branch chapter eleven verses seventeen through twenty one to explain the writer's appeal behold the severity of god chapter eleven verse twenty two at least the fall of jerusalem in the year seventy was necessary that was the first event of importance since the death of jesus in which christians could see a judgment upon the jews faults in the form expressions from time to time inadvertently used make it evident that the writer is not paul but is someone speaking in his name at a later date such for example are the passages in which the apostle betrays consciousness of being the representative of a party chapter three verse eight etc paul the born jew would not have called himself a debtor to greeks and barbarians chapter one verse fourteen the appeal to paul the israelite as a proof that god has not rejected his people chapter eleven verse one is plainly enough what would occur to a younger admirer and not to the apostle himself unless paul actually worked miracles the assertion in chapter fifteen verse nineteen points to some one distant enough to mix up truth and fiction in his life when as is supposed he wrote his epistle from corinth he was a free man and consequently could not speak to his fellow prisoners chapter sixteen verse seven the warning against false teachers chapter sixteen verses seventeen through twenty is explicable as put in the mouth of the apostle so that the orthodox might appeal to his authority in some present contest it could not have occurred to paul himself writing to the romans in the year fifty nine written gospels in our epistle to the romans there are traces of acquaintance with a written gospel 
the phrase in chapter two verse sixteen compare chapter one verse nine chapter sixteen verse twenty five is most intelligible as referring to a book and was so understood by origen eusebius and jerome from expressions not identical with but recalling those of our canonical gospels it may be inferred that occasionally something was taken over from the gospel spoken of the following are possibly examples of this procedure hodigon enai tuflon chapter two verse nineteen compare with matthew chapter fifteen verse fourteen luke chapter six verse thirty nine foston in scotai chapter two verse nineteen compare with matthew chapter five verse fourteen luke chapter eleven verse thirty five ho clinon chapter two verse one compare with matthew chapter seven verse one luke chapter six verse thirty seven more especially there may be cited eulogaita tus diukontas humas eulogaita kaimi katarasti chapter twelve verse fourteen compare with matthew chapter five verse forty four luke chapter six verse twenty eight love as the trifling of the law chapter thirteen verses eight through ten also galatians chapter five verse fourteen compare with matthew chapter twenty two verses thirty four through forty mark chapter twelve verses twenty eight through thirty four luke chapter ten verses twenty five through twenty seven hegastos himon per i he auton logon du sai tu theo chapter fourteen verse twelve compare with matthew chapter twelve verse thirty six perhaps the gospel used was the one recognized by the marcionites the friends of tradition who following the fathers mentioned above would identify it with our third gospel are confronted with the necessity of placing the epistle at least as late as the end of the first or the beginning of the second century unless they have the courage to accept the third gospel as a work which luke the companion of paul had already completed in any case the use of it indicates a later date than that which is traditionally assigned to the epistle to the romans book of acts a passage in the epistle such as chapter fifteen verses sixteen through thirty one has the air not of a real account of his works and plans by the apostle but of a decorated presentation of a tradition grace has been given to paul we are told to be a priest of the gospel among the nations whom he is to offer as an acceptable sacrifice to god chapter fifteen verse sixteen this is the language of one who knows him as the hero of a legend and wishes to make a deep impression on the reader what we hear about his missionary activity its extent and its complete success chapter fifteen verses nineteen and twenty three can be similarly interpreted as an exaggeration consecrated by tradition that the plans ascribed to him are merely put in his mouth is manifest from verses thirty and thirty one if we do not choose to ascribe to paul at once the art of reading the future and the desire against knowledge to rush on his own destruction without necessity we can only explain the fear expressed in these verses by what the pauline tradition had to tell of the dangers he ran at jerusalem and the ill acceptance of the contribution he brought with him this was not indeed a story of knowledge of which was gained from the acts of the apostles as one might be tempted at first to suppose for the author of acts deliberately glides over paul's bad reception by the saints and adds circumstances not alluded to in the epistle the outline of paul's future journey in this passage of romans was no more drawn from acts than were the statements that he and his had the first fruits of the spirit 
chapter 8, verse 23, and that he was specially called to preach the gospel among the heathen, chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. These prerogatives being there ascribed to quite different persons. Compare Acts chapter 2, chapters 10 through 11, chapter 15, verse 7. The traditional basis we recognize is that of the Acts of Paul, already disclosed as one of the documents that went to the composition of the canonical Acts. And that document, as we saw in part 1, was already of a legendary character, and cannot have been earlier than the end of the first century. d. Nationality of the Author In spite of his positively assuring us that he is a born Israelite, the writer comes forward constantly in the character of a Greek. He speaks Greek, and he thinks in Greek. His consciousness of being a Greek and not a Jew is betrayed by expressions such as the one already noted, Greeks and barbarians, chapter 1, verse 14. Just as the writer of 1 Corinthians, chapter 11, verse 4, reveals his nationality in holding it unfitted for a man to pray with covered head. The same explanation would remove all difficulty in the text of chapter 3, verse 9. The question would then mean, are we Greeks put at a disadvantage? To which the answer is, in no wise, for we have before proved of Jews as well as Greeks, that they are all under sin. The author forgets for a moment that he is speaking in the character of one who had been a Jew. Quite consistent with this interpretation, is the fact that he nowhere gives any sign of having consulted the Hebrew text of the Old Testament. Only in two places, chapter 11, verse 35, chapter 12, verse 19, can there be a doubt that the Septuagint was the text he used. And even here, all that is suggested is a variation in the reading, or the use of a Greek translation other than the one known to us. This is certainly not what we should expect from the former pupil of Gamaliel. It has been pointed out that Paul made much of the wisdom of Solomon, and clear traces of acquaintance with Philo have been detected. This again indicates contact with Alexandrian or Hellenistic Judaism, rather than with the thought of the Old Testament in its original form. For we must not forget that the wisdom of Solomon, originally written in Greek, belonged to the Septuagint. Thus, to explain the relationship between Paulinism and Judaism, there is no need to suppose that a Jew, by birth, was the writer of the principal epistles. Of acquaintance with Hebrew, there is no trace. Words like Abba, Satanas, Maranatha, were part of the common speech of early Christianity. E. Attempts at parrying difficulties. Many who have felt the difficulties of the Pauline authorship have tried to meet them by supposing interpolations, or a series of additions starting from a genuine Pauline basis. And attempts have been made to restore the original epistle to the Romans. This conjectural criticism, however, when carried through to any purpose, itself ends in practically abandoning the genuineness of the canonical epistle. And even in its extremest form, it does not touch the difficulty of assuming a more advanced doctrinal development than is thinkable in the lifetime of Paul. F. Arguments for Genuineness The appeal to external evidence falls to the ground. For in any case, it does not bring us in contact with contemporary witnesses. And the later witnesses cited, whether of the Orthodox Church or Gnostics, concerned themselves only with the contents and not with the origin of the writing. 
adaptation to their own doctrinal or disciplinary aims not critical research in our sense was what they had in view it is often said even the tubingen school accepted the four principal epistles this however means only that the critics thus named had never radically questioned the genuineness of those four for to some extent they found it necessary to suppose interpolations in them it does not mean that those particular epistles had emerged triumphantly from any systematic process of testing to which they were submitted along with the rest critics of a later age as is usual in the history of science may see further by placing themselves on the shoulders of their predecessors and however this may be the genuineness of a writing cannot be established simply by an appeal to traditional authority whether of the church or of science those who find in the epistle to the romans an image of the personality of paul have already formed their ideal of the apostle from a study of the writings attributed to him so that the argument is circular and unfortunately the various ideal pauls do not agree there is a catholic and a protestant paul an orthodox and a free-thinking paul and in fact each interpreter has his own no one denies that both in form and in content the epistles are peculiar but does this prove either individual authorship or the authorship of the apostle paul cannot the same thing be said of the fourth gospel of the apocalypse of john of the epistle to the hebrews of the epistle of barnabas yet the distinctive character of those compositions is not taken for a proof of their genuineness it is true that in the pauline epistles there is a marked unity of style which extends to the whole collection but mutatis mutandis this is equally true of the johannine literature gospels and epistles of the homeric poems and of many other collections earlier and later which are thereby proved indeed to have had their origin in definite circles but not necessarily to be the work of the persons whose names were attached to them not many years ago readers of the fourth gospel could feel on every page the heartbeats of the disciple whom jesus loved this ought to suggest caution especially as no one has yet been able to set forth in words an idea of the personality of paul which has satisfied an appreciable number of students there are in truth many voices in our epistle if one or other of these makes a powerful impression does it follow that it can proceed from no one but paul a writer of the requisite degree of power will not fail of effect when speaking under some great name of the past instead of under his own that the pauline ideas were not invented by the individual writers is of course admitted like the johannine ideas they were common to certain groups and arose earlier than the writings in which they were deposited g conjectural mode of origin to sum up the epistle of paul to the romans is a writing in the form of a letter but not having its origin even remotely in a real letter it is the product of repeated recasting extension and modification of a shorter epistle and was probably both in the earliest and in the later editions composed with the help of pre-existing treatises on various subjects of doctrinal and ethical nature the whole grew in the manner of a synoptic gospel out of that which had preceded it in the same kind the pre-existing letters and other pieces had this in common that they all issued from a single circle and were composed in the interest of a single direction of religious thought 
which we may call the Pauline, because it was attached to the name of Paul, as the Johannine was attached to the name of John. Paulinism was a deep-going effort, perhaps not at first conscious of its own meaning, to cut Christianity loose from Judaism, and to raise it to the stage of a universal religion. It appeals, as has been said, to a new revelation of the supreme God, whom hitherto neither Israel nor the heathen world has been able to find. God the Father, now at length revealed, has sent his Son and given him over to the alien powers that rule the world, so that he may redeem the chosen spiritual men for whom, to the temporary exclusion of all else in this world, God, who is himself spirit, is alone concerned. Those who have learned to know him are as many as are called by grace, through the preaching of the gospel, to faith. In the future, the world too will be redeemed, and God will be all in all. The Son, according to the newly revealed knowledge, came to earth in the apparently human form of Jesus, who, having been crucified by the hostile powers of the world, was raised by God from the dead. He will come again, will destroy the hostile powers, and then will resign to the Father the dominion over all things which he has temporarily assumed. What is of chief importance now is to know him, not after the flesh, but after the spirit, as the head of the community of believers, as the body of which they are the members, as himself the spirit. Outside Christ, man has no means of freeing himself from the bonds of sense and rising to a spiritual life. Thus, Paulinism was a new birth of the oldest Christianity. It began to teach that a salvation unattainable by the practice of moral virtue or by obedience to any law is offered gratuitously through Christ. This doctrine not unnaturally provoked fierce opposition. To some, it seemed dangerous by its teaching that man can do nothing for himself. Others it offended by its contempt for their hereditary piety towards Jewish ordinances. The opposition called forth defense. Small treatises began to be written in support of its various points as they emerged. Such literary activity was the more necessary because Paulinism was already a theology and not simply a religious preaching, like that of the early disciples, for whom the spoken word might suffice. Accordingly, one wrote in defense of justification by faith, Romans chapters 5 through 8. Another set himself to demonstrate that Jews and Greeks alike are under sin and alike are to be saved by receiving the gospel of the grace of God chapter 1 verse 16 through chapter 3 verse 31 another tried to show that abraham is indeed the father of all the faithful but that to descend from him according to the flesh signifies nothing chapter 4 others wrote on the question of israel's rejection chapters 9 through 11 Others, again, took more interest in ethical problems, personal matters, and social intercourse. Chapters 12 through 14. Of these representatives of Paulinism, some wrote for narrower, some for wider groups. Those who came later used in various measure the work of their predecessors. Sometimes whole passages, sentences, or parts of sentences were taken over unaltered into the text. Of this procedure, we can best form a notion by considering the use made of the Old Testament in the epistle. Besides direct quotations, 
indicated as such by the author, we find, for example, in chapter 3, verses 10 through 20, a series of verses from different contexts, introduced by a simple, as it is written. In other places we notice borrowing of words unaccompanied by any allusion to their source. In the case of First Peter, it has been observed that, along with this kind of use of the Old Testament, there goes similar use of Romans. The knowledge thus acquired of the way in which an apostolic letter could be put together may be carried back and further applied to explain the composition of the epistle to the Romans itself. And just as verses from the Old Testament were sometimes freely modified, so we may conjecture that it has been with the incorporated fragments of earlier Pauline treatises or epistles. One expositor would incline more to the right, another more to the left, and each would adapt accordingly. The author of the work in its present form belongs to what may be called the right, that is, to the more conservative or Jewish direction. His method is to place side by side with the most decided statements of the new doctrine expressions of profound respect for the law and for the privileges of Israel. Not infrequently he says yes and no on the same page. We can now only just detect beneath his redaction the conception which afterwards became distinctively Gnostic, that the God of the Jews is a lower power than the Father made known by the Gospel. There is in him already something of the Catholic spirit. The history of the origin of our epistle to the Romans is, in fine, no other than that of the canon. When you have understood the latter as the bringing together and formal authorizing of books that had sprung up in different circles, and had somehow acquired vogue with the Christian public, you have the key to the former also. The author or redactor of the epistle took what already had currency within limited circles and brought it together so that it might appeal to all sides within Paulinism. His aim being to conciliate the parties that were tending to break with one another. Just so the epistle was afterwards made part of a collection of epistles, and this collection brought into union with other groups of writings in a larger whole. In accordance with the literary method, customary in his social and religious environment, the author ascribed the work to the Apostle Paul himself. The real unity which, in his conception, pervaded the apparently opposed statements of Paulinism, was thus more impressively enforced than it could have been in any other way. The name of Paul was at once a covering shield, a watchword, and an introduction of the book to the reader. The adoption of the name of Paul has been explained as due to the fact that the movement really began from Paul, though from his oral and not from his written teaching. This explanation, however, supposes a more rapid development of doctrine than is historically thinkable, and the evidence available does not support the conjecture. Rather, we seem to find evidence, even in the traditional data of the epistles, for the opinion already expressed that Paul had not materially advanced beyond the position of the other disciples. According to the account in Galatians, the authorities at Jerusalem, on becoming acquainted with him, raised no objection to what he taught. Even the matter said to have been afterwards in dispute was only about the kind of intercourse with the heathen permitted to a born Jew, and indicates no such deep-going modification of doctrine as is, for the rest, implied in Galatians chapter 1 verse 11, etc. To the strangers among whom he preached, he gave milk and not solid food. 
1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 2. That is to say, his preaching was much simpler than the late Pauline gospel. Ought we not to see here a reminiscence of the teaching of the actual Paul? In a sense, it could be said by those who put themselves under the protection of his name that he had laid the foundation. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 6 through 15. But it had been left for others to build upon it and to introduce the new spiritual Christianity. As a matter of fact, we know no more why Pauline Christianity was called after Paul than why Johannine Christianity was called after John. We can only guess, and the conjecture seems reasonable that it was because of something impressive in the far-extended activity of the traveling preacher. We have no right to assert that it was through any affinity of doctrine between Paul and Paulinism. The fatherland of the new direction was undoubtedly the East, more exactly Syria. The choice of the name of Paul points to this, for according to his history, so far as we can trace it, the center of his apostolic activity was the Syrian Antioch. Syria is indicated also by the use of the name Abba. Romans chapter 8 verse 15, Galatians chapter 4 verse 6. Of the expression Maranatha, 1 Corinthians chapter 16 verse 22. Of the proper name Kephas for Peter. But above all, by the close relationship between Paulinism and Gnosticism. Of this relationship, there is no doubt. The Pauline literature, as we have seen, was first brought into repute by the Gnostics, and when the Catholics, from Irenaeus onward, began to prepare a place for Paul in the bosom of the church, the Gnostics were still not to be outdone. Some of them imagined the apostle as sitting on the right hand of Christ, with Marcion on the left, while others held that he was the paraclete announced in John chapter 15, verse 26. Now, Christian Gnosticism appeared first in Syria. From the origin of Paulinism in the East, however, it does not follow that the epistle to the Romans received the finishing touches there. An older text may have been brought by the Gnostics from Syria to Rome, where it was perhaps modified, in the sense desired, by the Paulinists of the right. With or without further revision, it passed, like many another writing, and many a usage and doctrinal conception, from the hands of the Gnostics into those of the Catholics. End of Part 2, Chapter 4